Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. And his hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen, and a cloth was around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. It's in John chapter 11. Lazarus was a living body wrapped up in gross, filthy, smelly, soiled grave clothes, the wrappings of death. And that story of Jesus Christ raising Lazarus from the dead is familiar to almost all of us, but I want you to turn with me really quick before we get into the passage at hand this morning to John chapter 11. Turn with me to John chapter 11. And we might remember the story. There were siblings, and Jesus loved these siblings, and he had stayed with them at times. And we can recall that when Lazarus was sick, Mary, his sister, and his other sister, Martha, knew that their brother was seriously ill. And they sent a messenger out to go find Jesus that he might return and heal their brother. And Jesus, he was out, he was doing miracles, and he was preaching and teaching, and a messenger came to Jesus, and Jesus did love them, but he purposely delayed going to help Lazarus. And the man actually died. And once Jesus arrived, Martha ran out to meet him and telling him how Lazarus wouldn't have died if he had just been there. And that's what I want you to look at with me this morning. In John 11, verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now, maybe Martha had heard about the story with the woman at the well, or maybe Jesus had shared when he stayed there many times that Jesus told the woman at the well in John 4, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall, leave, he shall live. And whoever lives shall never die. And he asked that woman at the well, do you believe this? So the situation with Martha and Mary and Lazarus is the, de- the, the guy's dead. The brother's in the tomb. And they're sad and they're crying and some are wailing. And Jesus shows up and he's sad too. And Jesus is crying And he asked, take me where they had laid him. Take me. Lazarus was dead. His body was rotting, laying in this cave tomb wrapped in strips of linen. And a lot of times they would prepare a body by wrapping it up, almost like a mummy in strips of linen from head to toe. And that's how his body was prepared. So pick up with me down in verse 38 of chapter 11 of John. 11.38 says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was the cave with the stone laid across the entrance. In verse 39, it says, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. He has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe that you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always are are hearing me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out with his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. It's an amazing story. 
And I don't want to spiritualize the text, but however, there's a, an amazing illustration that we can see in the story of Lazarus. There's a picture that we can see for us this morning, based on the text this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, that you're brought back to life, but yet you still have the spiritual wrappings of death. We have been raised from the dead, spiritually speaking. A spiritual resurrection in Christ. And John MacArthur, in some of his writings, has made this connection. And I think it's a vivid illustration for us this morning. And the reason I chose it is because it burns what we're going to talk about into our minds in such a way that you will not forget. Look, we understand what's happening here. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And he's demonstrating for those there who he was. And he demonstrates through the story of the raising Lazarus from the dead who he is for us, who he actually is. He literally and physically and in all actuality raised a dead person that was physically dead back to life. Who has power over life and death? Only God. Only God. So therefore, on a spiritual level, we understand that he's only God and he can do that. But let's take it to our own walk. We are now believers, and the story of Lazarus provides for us a graphic illustration of every one of our condition post-conversion, after we become believers. The moment of our salvation, the very moment that you put faith in Christ and repented of your sins, there's a spiritual analogy in Lazarus for us. Yes, he was physically raised, but you were spiritually raised. You were spiritually raised from spiritual death, and just like he said, Lazarus, come forth, and you see, uh, as we have obeyed God's call to us and submitted to Christ as Lord, we have been raised. We were dead in our trespasses, right? And yet now, because of the power of Jesus, we live. And he's called every one of us out of a tomb, spiritually speaking. Just like he said, Lazarus, come forth. He said, Sam, come forth. Just like Lazarus, he said, Curtis, come forth. And Art, and Kathy, and Anne, and Jonathan, and Barbara, he said, come forth. Indeed, he physically has called us He will on that day, the final day, call us by name, but now he spiritually called us to resurrection in a new life with him. He called us out of spiritual death. So we were in the grave, we were spiritually dead, awaiting final judgment on the last day, and the Spirit arrested our heart through regeneration, gave us the ability to understand the truth. We were spiritually dead, now we're spiritually alive, and then that hand of God that awakened us, we start to hear the good shepherd call our name. And Jesus is calling the name of his sheep, and he tells us that the sheep know his voice. And so you heard his voice, and you responded to it. And he is our shepherd, and we are his sheep. Do you see the analogy there? A dead man brought back to life by the word of life, Christ, still having the grave clothes wrapped around him, We have things wrapped around us still too, right? Spiritual grave clothes, our sin, the sin that we battle as believers, indwelling sin, the sin that so easily entangles us. So Lazarus is a beautiful picture. He's a living body wrapped up in soiled grave clothes, and we too are now living wrapped up in spiritual soiled grave clothes, our sin that we still battle, the old man. Grave clothes that carry that stench of death because we used to be dead and now we're alive. So we are living people by the power of God and we've been changed on the inside and we still deal with this flesh. We still deal with our sin. And we know this as Christians, positionally we clean Positionally, like I've told you before, when God the Father looks at you, he sees Christ. Christ is covering you. So positionally, you're made right. You're made just. That is an amazing thing. A holy father can accept an unholy person because the holy son steps in front. But in reality, can I get an amen? We battle the flesh. Every day. We battle the flesh. We battle our humanness. Go read the end of chapter 7 and look at what Paul's talking about how his life is. He battles the flesh, as a mature man of God, 
the sins that formerly positioned us against the holy God, that we're going to get his wrath exercised on us. In essence, we're standing spiritually raised people with the humanness still wrapped around us. And we need to get those filthy rags off. Just like Jesus said, loose him and let him go. We need to get the filthy rags off of us. This weak and mortal flesh that's struggling against a spiritual living person that's in us. And Jesus is saying, loose him and let him go. The thing of it is, it all happened at once for Lazarus. But for us, it's an entire lifetime. You know what it's called? It's not justification. But after justification, it becomes what? Sanctification. It's a lifelong process. It's progressive over a long period of time. And it's like a, a, a roller coaster, up and down. You're on a mountaintop doing good, then you're down in the valley. But the trajectory is up. The trajectory is Christ-likeness. And that's, the, that's where we're all at. That's where we all live. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures shaping us to the Son's image. That's what we're all doing here. Becoming more and more like Christ, less and less like the old man, figuratively speaking, getting the grave clothes off. Unwrapping them. Discarding them. Sadly, though, <laughs> we don't always want to be sanctified. And some of those grave clothes, we like them. They're comfortable. We put them back on. We move back away from the Lord, back into the old man's ways. We battle temptation. They're comfortable. They're like a well-worn glove. I like them. I like these smelly garments at times. And so we fight the battle of our own self wanting to put, put them back on and not take them off. Have you ever done that? So it's a lifelong battle against sin, ultimately against Satan himself. And as we go through this passage this morning, I don't want you to lose that sight of what happened with Lazarus, because that's exactly what's happening to us, spiritually speaking. So turn with me to chapter 4 of Ephesians, and we'll pick up in verse 17. And I would just keep these things in your mind, some questions for yourself. What are you supposed to discard from your old man? What are you supposed to get rid of? What are you supposed to put off? What are you supposed to put on as a new man, as a new person in Christ? You need spiritual wardrobe. And so the outline is two points this morning. It's very simple. Old man, old clothes. New man, new clothes. That's the best I could come up with. Sorry. <laughs> You're a dead person. You have two choices. All of us sitting here have two choices. You're either a dead man that Jesus brought back to life and you're trying to get the grave clothes off and it's a sanctification process that lasts your whole life or you're a dead man wearing dead clothes in a dead man's tomb waiting for to be judged. That's your two choices. And I don't know who's who. That's between you and the Lord. But let's keep this in mind as we go to chapter four, verse 17. Let's read it together. Paul goes on to say, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk. And the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become calloused, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus. That, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, who has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Let, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we come before this passage, and I pray that you would move in us in a mighty way. If there are those of us who have been fighting, putting the grave clothes back on, fighting, not wanting to take them off, pulling back and wanting it our way, God, may you help us to repent of that and turn to you and move with the renewal of the mind towards Christ-likeness. 
And God, we can't do that. You've given us your spirit to empower us to do that. So I pray that you would move in us and that we would repent where we failed to do this and we would try and mature in Christ and try and move forward as a body of believers. And then there are those who are lost and they don't want you. And they like the wrappings of death and they like the old man and they don't want to move to you. And Father, I pray that you would break up their hard heart even this morning. Father, we thank and love you. In Jesus Christ's mighty name we pray, amen. So number one, I couldn't think of anything more poetic, so we got old man, old clothes. Number one, in your outlines, verse 17 through 19, let's just dissect it a little bit together. Verse 17 says, so this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, having given themselves over to the sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now Paul says right here in the beginning of verse 17, so I say, affirm together with the Lord. I'm telling you this, and I'm affirming together with the Lord. I'm gonna tell you something, and I'm gonna tell you something that is affirming what the Lord wants, what the Lord wants to tell you what he desires for your life, what his will is for your life. If you're a believer, then in Christ, what are you? A new creation. And no longer, you're no longer the old man. So that old man's life, you don't wanna be living that old man's life anymore. You're a new man, you're a new woman, you're a new creation in Christ, you're changed. The old man's gone and the new man has come, but the old man's clothes are still on you. The wrappings are still on you. And if you're a Christ follower, if you're a disciple of Christ, Paul says, you need to desire what I desire, and what I desire is what Christ desires, and I'm gonna tell you what it is. The next phrase in verse 17b says that you no longer walk, which means live, as the Gentiles do. Don't walk and live like the Gentiles do. How did the Gentiles walk? How did the Gentiles without Christ live? Well, look back one page at Ephesians chapter two. We went through it a couple of months ago. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. He's speaking to the Gentile believers within the church at Ephesus, and he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked or lived according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them too, all of us formerly lived or walked in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and mind, and were by nature children of wrath as the rest. So how did they live? How did the Gentiles live? What are they about their life? They're dead, they're in sin, they're walking according to Satan, they're walking according to Satan's world, they are sons of disobedience, they're lustful and desire things that indulge the flesh, and they're by nature children of wrath. That's what it is. And Jesus is agreeing with Paul saying he's agreeing that Jesus and Paul is telling us don't walk that way anymore. Don't live how that person used to live that is you who's been raised from the dead. So here in this morning's text, the first description Paul gives on top of that is 17C. You want to know what he wraps that up in new? He says right away, this is how you know that you're in that camp. You walk in the futility of your mind. You think you know better than God? So who are the Gentiles anyway? That just means non-Jew. So let's just say all other people groups in the entire planet who weren't God's chosen people, all of them. They're walking in a futility of their mind just doing what they think according to what they think and how they think and if you got everything to go the way you think, you're in trouble. You'd be in trouble. It's not supposed to be for the one in Christ to do it your own way anymore. It's not supposed to be for us. We're called to get those old clothes off. So even as a Christian, if you fall back and you know, I'm just gonna do it my way. I know God's word says this, but. I know God's word says don't marry a non-believer, but I love them and maybe they'll come to the Lord later. 
Don't become unequally yoked and you start a business with a non-believer. Why is there problems down the road? You didn't listen to what he said. Why can't I have sex before marriage? You don't listen to what he says. Why should I uh, do this and why shouldn't I do that? And why are there all these commandments? Because God loves you and he doesn't want you to walk in that way. But we choose in the futility of our mind to think we're going to come out with a different outcome if we do it. So you might be here this morning, and you might have just visited this morning. You might say, well, I don't know if I am a Christian. I mean, everyone thinks I'm a Christian because I'm at church, but maybe I'm not a Christian. Then you're still aligning yourself as a Gentile. Outside of God's promise to the people of Israel, outside of you following what the Spirit would have and the, the Word would have, outside of what Christ would have, and the Apostle Paul is saying, look, you're just in the futility of mind thinking you're okay. I hope what I do in life is good enough to get to heaven. You're wrong. You're futile in thinking that. And if you're a Christian and you're going to think you're going to do it your own way, you're wrong, and that's acting like the old man. You have to get those garbs off. You know what it's like? I've used this analogy with my kids. It's like, I would say, throwing bricks in the Grand Canyon. I'll say, that's futile what you're doing. It's like throwing bricks in the Grand Canyon. You can throw bricks your entire lifetime in the Grand Canyon. What's it going to do? Nothing. You can throw bricks in the Grand Canyon a thousand lifetimes. What is it going to do? Nothing. You're not going to fill that up. It's a mile across. You're not going to do anything. You're just going to wear your arm out, wear your life out. It's like, it's like imagine a huge dam. It's 10 stories tall, 18 foot thick. It's cracking. It's about to burst, and you're at the bottom. You're going to hold it together with your bare hands. It's futility. And God's telling us, don't live that way. Don't run your life with intellectual futility in your mind. And verse 18a says, you're being darkened in your understanding. That's why you can't trust it. You know the saying that you have a light bulb moment? It's like, ding, the light bulb of the little word bubble. Yeah. Well, your light bulb's broke. Your light bulb's burnt out. You picture yourself, you picture a word bubble, you have an idea, it's a shattered light bulb, it doesn't work. You have no ideas. You have nothing. You have an empty word bubble. It's blackened in. If you live like the old man, you're just living with the blinders on your face, covering, not seeing the truth. And if you stay in that condition as a non-believer, you're in trouble in the end, and you think you're fine, and Satan makes you think you're fine, but you're not that way anymore. You're Christians. You're a new man. You don't live with a darkened understanding anymore. You have an enlightened understanding with the Word. But what do we as Christians do? We push this away, and we still look out to the world, because we think it's going to have a different effect, but we know we're in. I said the 14-word prayer. We're in. And we try and do things our way still. So what is the sum of a person that stays that way? They're living like a Gentile, without Christ, far away from him, and they're excluded from life, 18b, excluded from life of God because of their ignorance. They're excluded. Now, what's another way of saying you're, you're excluded from something? You're not included in it. So when I read that, I like to think of the reverse because it's more powerful in my thinking, in my mind. Excluded from the life, which means you're not included in life. Well, what's life in God? Eternal life. So if you're here this morning and you think you know better and you think you, there's another way, you're darkening your understanding, you're ignorant, and the fact is your light bulb's broke and you're going to choose something that in the end is going to fail and there's no eternal life. You're not included in eternal life with God. If you're not a Christian, in essence, you're walking through life according to your own mind and in the end, your own choices lead you to death and if you're excluded from life and God, what happens after the first death? The second death, which is the eternal judgment in hell. And I grew up with my mom saying, oh, ignorance is bliss. Well, I don't know anything, la, 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 la. Ignorance is bliss. That's not a true statement. Ignorance is bliss is a lie. It's a lie that will lead you to hell because Apostle Paul is telling us here, you're excluded from life because of ignorance. Ignorance to what? The truth. So you don't want to be ignorant. And Paul is calling us believers, all of us as believers in this text, that we shouldn't walk that way anymore. We're different now. Why are we walking that way still at times? 
We're matching our old lost position sometimes. Have you ever known the old guy to come out? Like you're having something go on in your life and there's the old John coming out. He's dead. The old John's dead. But we still f- battle with getting the grave clothes off. So don't walk through life as a Christian, as a Christ follower, and choose to be ignorant with what God calls you to do. When the things are in the scripture, God tells you these things because he loves you. We're supposed to walk in them and do them. We don't stop at the Great Commission until we get to the end of the Great Commission, which says, teach them to do what? Obey everything I've commanded, Jesus said. So my warning to you, and it's for me too, we can't have a blindfold on and walk through life as a Christian. Don't walk through life with a blindfold on. And don't push back against your maker. Don't be stubborn in your heart against him. And if you're a non-believer here today, I'm warning you, God repeatedly said in the Old Testament, warned his people, do not harden your heart against me. Don't stiffen your neck against me because we, re- we re- resist him at times. Even as believers, we resist him. I'm calling you to go to a third world country as a missionary. Are you sure, God? That's really not what I've had planned I'm calling your son or daughter to go. Are you sure? I don't want them going over there. We always have a way to bargain with the Lord. And the truth is, you're going to resist him at times, and we need to learn to take those wrappings off and trust him and not live like the old men. Because if you stay that way and you never follow him, no matter what you've prayed, if you don't follow him in life and you have a hardness of heart till the end, then he goes ahead and finishes us off. So you're here this morning and you don't believe in Jesus, you need to relinquish that throne to the Lord. And if you're here this morning and your heart is like a piece of granite, he needs to soften it. And you're darkening your understanding and he needs to give you light. And I would pray that the Spirit would soften you this morning so you would choose him and your mind would be enlightened. And he would regenerate your heart and make it soft. But us Christians, I want to to tell us, the majority of us in this room, I would assume are Christians. But I want to tell you, we need to heed the warning. We We can't live like the old guy. We can't live like the dead man. And that's exactly what progressive sanctification is dealing with. You're dealing with the old man's Grave clothes, the sin. We should not walk in the futility of our mind because we can do that as believers. We should not walk with the darkened understanding. We can do that as believers. We can walk through ignorance. I've prayed and said, Lord, repent. I want to repent of everything I've done wrong, and I name them. And then I repent of stuff I may be ignorant to because I don't know this well enough to know I'm actually doing something that's against you. I've had people say, well, I worry a lot. You know, I don't really do a lot of sinning. Worry is like an affront to God. Really? Yeah, really. So, so sometimes we think we're okay and we're not okay. So we need to take this to heart. Don't harden your heart in certain areas. We tell the Lord, you can have all my life except this one closet of my house and my life. You can have this whole thing but not this one room or not the basement. I want this space for myself still. And we won't give him all of us. And if you keep doing that, what happens? He goes in 19a. A non-believer, if they keep doing that, they just keep becoming more and more, and they have him become callous. Who's ever chopped wood? It's not fun, right? The movies make it look way more glamorous. You're not working out Rocky Babo and it's, yeah, nothing. Who's ever taken a spade tip shovel, went in the backyard, we have a lot of clay around here, and tried to dig a trench in your backyard? Anyone? Okay. Okay, I want you to think about this. With every swing of that hickory handle of the axe, and every time that that pressure rubs on your hand in the same spot, through gloves, rubbing and pushing that same area, and with every swing and every jolt of it hitting the target, pushing and hammering on one spot on your hand, what happens to there? Blister. And then you jump on a shovel, and you get that first pullback. You're like, this is going to be amazing. No, it's not. (laughs) And then you think, I can't get under it. So you use your palm of your hand, and you push the shovel in trying to get under it. 
and you do that for several hours and you have gloves on, what happens to that one spot in your hand? Blister. Okay. So we get that. We understand. You push and push and push and the pressure tears and it hurts and you realize I'm just a weekend warrior and I usually sit behind a desk and I shouldn't be doing this. I should pay somebody to do this. And this is painful. You know, I haven't done anything, but now I'm going to dig an entire trench around my house. No, you won't. It's going to be painful and it's not going to be fun. But what if, you did, what if you ignored that pain? What if that was your job and you did it today and then the, the blister healed and you did it tomorrow and then it tore it up again, but then you did it again and again every day, every week, every month for years on in? What builds up? Calluses. Calluses. What, what badly hurt at first starts to hurt less. Layer upon layer, skin repairs. Layer upon layer, skin builds up. It's a solid mass of callus tissue. It's thick. It's rugged. It's desensitized to pain. And the owner wants to inflict pain on it, but it can take it because it doesn't feel the pain anymore. And with that in mind, you see what Paul's saying to you here is that if you live with intellectual futility, if you live with ignorance of God's truth, if you live that way and keep pushing and pushing, you become spiritually calloused, morally calloused, the same punishing things that you do to yourself, spiritually, morally speaking, they don't impact you anymore. They don't hurt as much anymore. It's easier to do them. So this is the idea in the full sense that the non-believer makes this, is they just keep on sinning, they sear their conscience over, they have a callous over their mind and heart, and it no longer bothers them to walk into heinous sin even. And we have to be believe. We have to be careful as believers not to do this in certain areas of our life. We get desensitized that this is wrong, and we keep doing it, and we become callous. So Paul is warning those Ephesian believers, and he's warning us here today not to walk in the old man's ways. Don't continue to wear the old man's clothes. Not to allow yourself to become callous to the things of God. Callous to where you're going against God and his word. And if you keep doing them repeatedly ongoing, you get desensitized to it. And the end game is what? The last phrase. You give yourself over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. You just want more. That's the outcome. That's the old man in the old clothes. That's the outcome. So look, when I look at this, I just like, we're all Christians here, most of us. We're new men and women. The old person is dead. The old person is gone positionally. But we are fighting just like Lazarus to get those grave clothes off, but he got them off all at once with help. We're using him and the word and the spirit, and we're trying to get these grave clothes off, but we still have our humanness, and we push back. And we battle against this, even as saved individuals. And we can't live like that anymore. You have to ask God to help you not to be futile in your thinking, not to be ignorant to the word, and not to become callous to what is wrong, and not to have a depraved mind. We've been called out of the grave. Christians, we've been called out of the grave. Lazarus, come out. Take the grave clothes off, Jesus said. You're justified. You came out of the grave. Now you need to be sanctified. Get the grave clothes off. I think it's a beautiful picture. Christ saved us from the penalty of those sins. Charles Spurgeon said this, Christ promises to save his people from their sins, not in their sins. Some people will say today, Jesus just wants to meet you where you're at. He doesn't want you to stay there. But much of Christianity today is talking about just stay there, I'm free, I can do all this stuff. No, you can't. You're ignorant to the truth by saying that. Well, we should not tell people that they need to repent because that's harsh. Read the Bible, pastor. Read the, what Jesus says. We need to save people by giving them the word and Christ saving them with the spirit and the word and then they need to be sanctified with the word and that's us building the body. Remember, being equipped to build up the body, giving pastors and teachers to the church to bring us up so that we start growing in our faith and being mature in our faith and we're the new man, we put on some new clothes and the old man's dead but we're fighting those old clothes. 
You and I are believers, right? So we should actually start living like we're believers, right? And I felt this every day, and I'm sure maybe not all of you, but some of you fail every day, maybe every other day. Which takes us to number two in our outlines. And I've broken all rules of preaching. You're supposed to have at least three points. We have two, sorry. Sorry, two. Number two, new man, new clothes. Verse 20 through 24. Chapter four, verse 20 says this. Paul says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him. Just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you may be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Paul opens up verse 20 with the word but, and when you read the word but, if you're going to study your Bible, you know you have to go back to see what was being talked about, and you know he's going to be contrasting what he just talked about. So he talked about the old man in the old clothes, now he's going to contrast that to the new man with the new clothes, the believer, the Lazarus out of the tomb person, spiritually speaking. If you're a Christian, Paul's saying to you, at times you may act like that old person, that's the first few uses we first few verses we went through, but you may try putting those grave clothes back on at times, amen, we all do that, but he says, you did not learn Christ this way. You're battling the old man, I get that, but you didn't learn Christ this way. Verse 20a, we must live a Christ-centered life. He's the one that saved us. We're supposed to do it his way, not our way. Christ-centered life, which means a word-centered life, which means a spirit-filled life, a spirit-led life. We start doing what this says and not what this says. Not to get saved, not to gain a place, but because we are saved. Right? It's the fruit, not the root, we say. We must be living a Christ-centered life. And to quote what he says in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul himself says, you need to walk in a manner what? Worthy, remember that? Walk in a manner worthy of the calling. He called you, he saved you, now live that way. It's actually pretty simple math. It's just we fight this. We fight what we want. And we think over uh, Ephesians, and I was just thinking about this as I was studying this week. How did we learn Christ? Based on just what we learned from Ephesians. We learned Christ because we were blessed with the, being elected by the Father in the past. We were blessed through Christ, his redemption on the cross. We were blessed because of the sealing and, and the, the knowing that we're going to have an inheritance through the Spirit for glory in heaven. We understand as Gentiles, we're brought near to Christ before we were far off from Christ. With no chance, no hope. And we understand the power that raised Jesus from the, from the grave is the same power that raises you and I from the grave. And we understand that we have a portion in Christ. We understand that we have a position in Christ. We understand that we're spiritually dead apart from him, and now we're alive because of him. And we understand we're his now. You're not your own. You're his now. And we've been bought with a price, and we've been taught that we're supposed to be living to do works. We're not living because of our works. We're living to do works. The work that we're living by is his work on the cross. And we've been taught that doesn't mean you're not supposed to have any works. That's evidence that you're in Christ. And we understand that we're included in Christ and there's a mystery that Paul was preaching and the mystery was the, the, the non-spiritual Jews are still out but the spiritual Jews are in, and the non-spiritual Gentiles are still out, but the spiritual Gentiles are still in, and those make up the church. Jew and Gentile, one plus one equals one. We're Christians. We've been made worthy to, to walk. He saved you. We've been secured outside of yourself, and now we're supposed to live that walk that's worthy of the calling. We're supposed to be living that way because of whose we are and what we've been instructed to do. We're to live in such a way to show the light out there. And Christ has given us gifts. Each and every person 
in the, in the room as a believer has been given giftedness that he prepared works for you to walk in them, Ephesians chapter 2. And then he gave gifts, we've learned just recently, to the whole church, pastors and teachers, and then prophets and evangelists, and you go back to uh, the apostles. He gave gifts to the whole church that we could be what? Equipped. You're being equipped by the word. If John teaches, if I teach, if you go to a Bible study, you're being equipped so you can do the service. We all do the service. And then that builds up the whole body with service to one another. Somebody will tell me I have a spiritual gift and this thing is my personal thing with God. That's not a gift. Gifts aren't for you. Christ gives gifts for the body. So what you have, somebody else needs. What I have, somebody else needs. And we're all building up the body through Christ together. So we understand these things. We've been taught from this book. We've been taught from the book of Ephesians that we've been placed in the unity of believers and we have Christ has given us gifts and we understand that those gifts are to build up the whole body and then we understand that we need to be maturing in the knowledge. Why? Because if you don't have knowledge and sound doctrine, you're just put, pushed around like a little baby. And everything you hear and everything that's on social media, you just like gulp it down. It had Jesus on there and there was a cross in the corner and you gulp it down. And he's just saying, no, get to know this. Be used by this. Use your giftedness out here. Be taught. Be equipped so you can push back on false teaching. You won't be pulled astray by false teaching. And then we grow on the foundation of the truth to promote truth and love out there. And we evangelize. All of us evangelize out there. It's amazing. And the thing that I would just ask all of us, have you learned Christ in this way, actually? You personally, have you learned Christ in this way? He's not a lucky rabbit's foot. He's not something to add to your life. It's not about addition. It's about submission. I learned that in a cheesy Netflix movie one time. It's the one good thing in the whole movie, that one line. Have you placed your faith in the truth which is Christ? You have to ask yourself that. Verse 21 says, if indeed you did hear him, did you really hear what the Lord said? Did you really respond to the truth of what the Lord is? Have you been taught in him the truth that is Jesus from the word, the word of life? This is the living word. The word became what? Flesh. So he's saying, if you've heard this, it's not a foregone conclusion that we've all been placed in Christ because we're here? So let me ask you again before we move on. Have you heard him? Have you been taught in him the truth that is in Christ? Are you called out of the tomb? Are you falling in obedience to remove the grave clothes? Is the truth of Jesus in you? Are you like Lazarus, are you a dead man brought to life just trying to get the dirty clothes off? Or are you a dead man in dead man's clothes still? But us as believers, we gotta lay aside the old man. We gotta renew our minds. Jesus said this, take off the grave clothes and let them go. Remember he said that in John 11? He's like hopping around like a mummy. He's saying, take those things off so he's living. Let him walk, let him be free. And so Paul's telling us in reference to our spiritual life, in connection with our spiritual life, the old life is gone, the new life is there, the dead one is past, the new one is there, and he says this in verse 21a, in reference to your former manner of life when you were in the tomb, lay that aside. Lay it aside. If somebody at your work or your school or in your family would be surprised you're a Christian, you have a problem. If you're two different people, when other people are around you, you have a problem. You have to lay aside that old one. You can't walk the fence. Jesus said salt water and fresh water don't come from the same spring. You can't live on both sides of the fence. The apostle's telling us the old man's gone, get the grave clothes off, it's corrupting us, it's corrupting us, it's corrupting you and I. Lay aside those things. Get those grave clothes off. Verse 23 says, what do you need to put on? Be renewed in your spirit, in your spirit of your mind. Doesn't that sound like a lot like Romans 12 too? It's almost like there's one author of the Bible. 
Romans 12, 2 almost says the same thing. Renewal of the mind. What does the renewing of the mind mean? You get this in here. And when this gets in here, it filters down to your heart and it comes out as conviction. It comes out as obedience. It comes out in your life. It comes out as Christ-likeness with the Spirit's power. You're not doing it. He's doing it. But all Christians have the capability of growing in the Christ-likeness in some measure. Why? Because every one of us has the Spirit. Not just the super holy ones. All of us have the Spirit right at belief. We have all the Spirit all the time. All believers do. And we've heard Christ, we've heard him in the proper way, we've been taught in Christ according to the truth which is here. Now that truth needs to do something, it needs to move in us and transform us in the Christ likeness. Verse 24b says, which is the likeness of God. You want to be transformed into the likeness of God, let's say Christ likeness, and that's created in righteousness and holiness and the truth. So if you're a Christian this morning, you're in Christ and you're a new creation. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have done what? They pass away, and behold, what has come? But what do we want sometimes? We want the old things still. That's a battle. You know why Ephesians, we're jumping to the end of the book, but you know why it ends with the spiritual armor? Because we need that, because it's a battle. And you need to put that spiritual armor on. We'll learn more about it in a couple months. But you put it on, keep it on, sleep in the armor, go to work in the armor, drive to work in the armor. You don't take the armor off because we need it. You could, those old things are gone. We're supposed to live that way, but it's a battle because we still want what we want. And we're willing to sin to get it. And I'm talking about Christians, not just non-believers. I'm talking about me, actually, not just you. If you're sitting here this morning and you know Christ, you're a new creation, you're a new man, you're not the old man, it's passed away, the grave clothes need to come off, and behold, the new man is alive, and you need new clothes. You need a spiritual wardrobe to put on, and that's what this is talking about. That is Christ's likeness. That's when they see you out there in the community, and you act like Christ would in certain circumstances, and somebody will ask you, pray for this, pray for somebody to ask you, why are you acting this way in this situation? It doesn't make sense. And you can say, because it's Christ, that's why. You need to be, and I need to be, being transformed to Christ likeness. We need to put the new wardrobe on. The old man who once was there, he's spiritually dead, and he's gone. And you're new in Christ, and you're raised to spiritual life, and you've come out of the tomb, and spiritually speaking, you remove those clothes of sin, and you're progressing through sanctification, and you're more like Jesus and less like the old man, but you fight it, you fight it, because you want the old stuff on. And we need to be challenged in this. J.I. Packer said this, the New Testament does not say that Christians must leave holy lives in order to become saints. I guess the Catholic Church missed that one. It says instead, Christians, the Bible tells us that because we are saints, they must henceforth live holy lives. So anything in Christianity that's out there today, I'm telling you, that says it doesn't matter how you live, it matters only what you believe, is a lie. We're not gaining position, but because of who we are and whose we are, we're in the body of Christ, we're part of the body, which Jesus Christ is the head, we're part of the bricks making up the temple of God, we're part of his family, we sit at his table, we're citizens of heaven, we're aliens here, all those things point to holy living, a separate, different part. You don't live like they live, we live different than they live. If there's no difference between you and your unbelieving neighbor, you have a problem. He does too, but you have one. And the Lord needs to work in our heart. So what do we do with this passage? Well, I'm just saying, if we're believers, we need to repent a lot. Often. Do you realize, I, I truly believe this, we must live in a constant state of repentance as believers. Yes, we have glory. Yes, we have joy and contentment. But we mess up all the time. We put the clothes back on all the time. And we have to keep giving it back over to the Lord. Asking him to help us over and over and over. And we slowly progress on this roller coaster of up and down. And we never make it till we die. We still have a few things on when we die. And some of us may be half dressed when we die. I don't know. 
But we need to live in a constant state of repentance. We all need to do that. We can't live in the world and then be like the world. We're supposed to be separate from the world. We're supposed to be saints. Saints, remember what I told you before? It means set apart ones. And you're not set apart if you're just joining in. And Jesus said if the world loves you, they only love their own. So if the world loves you, you have a problem. You have a spiritual problem. So we as Christians need to really ask the Lord to help us put those things off and put some other things on. Remove the grave clothes of our sin and put on the worthy of walking in the manner of our calling, our position. We're heirs to the throne of God. We're gonna have a seat at his table. We need to put the old man's ways to death and we need to be like Lazarus, remove all the grave clothes. Turn with me to Galatians just one book bath back. Galatians 5, maybe one or two pages. Depends on how your Bible's laid out. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. And you're thinking, look, I'm a little hard-headed. You're going to get more clear than you've been, John. And I'll say, amen, let's go get more clear. What kind of things are the old man? What kind of things are the new man? What kind of things are you supposed to not do? And what kind of things are you supposed to do? It's all right here in Galatians chapter 5 for us. Verse 19b, in the middle, which are immorality. Do you see that? So let me give you a list. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. It's pretty big. And there's maybe categories here. There's subcategories here. But let's just go through the list. The old man's ways, the wrappings of death, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of, ang- outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, breathe again, carousing, and things like these. Just any other thing you can think of that's negative. And he said, I forewarned you, just as I forewarn you now, that you should not practice those things. And the one who practices those things, he's not going to heaven because he's the world. You're saying, yeah, but John, I'm not an idolater. Oh, really? There's no idols in your heart you follow sometimes over God? Well, I'm not immoral. Really? You got that much control over your eyeballs, men? Sorcery? I don't know. You read fortune cookies and tape them on your desk? (laughs) Strife, enmities? How does that happen? Whoever's ever heard of a church split? Come on. Jealousy? Come on. It's me. Submit it. We have disputes, we have anger, and anger is the same as murder, Jesus said, the Sermon on the Mount. We have factions and we have drunkenness. No, I don't. I don't, I don't get drunk. I know that's wrong. But, you know, I drink. Well, do you become buzzed? What's drunk? Do you do something that you think is okay but you're stumbling another brother? That's sin. That's not on the list, but that's sin. Carousing? What is that? I don't know. Do you go to the clubs if you're a young person? Well, I just like the dancing. Oh, Really? So so this is something for all of us. He's just saying, I'm warning you. If you live exactly like the world, you're not going to go into the kingdom. Because if you were living in Christ, you would start pulling away from the world. Not perfectly. Not pharisaically. If you're alive in Christ, live unto Christ. In real life, every day. The old man's gone. He's out. The old clothes have to be taken off. You're a new creation. Christ's likeness is the new clothes. You're supposed to be transformed. And that doesn't happen by osmosis. You have the Holy Spirit. His, one of his things he does is illuminate this to your mind and heart and gives you the power to obey it and to fail, uh, uh, to, to kill sin and to fail to fall to temptation. You have to get this in there. That doesn't just happen by osmosis. That doesn't happen by one hour here on Sunday morning. We have to get this on. And guess what? Everyone's watching us. You could do all this all day, even with your own family, and they're watching you. They're not listening to what you're saying. So if we look like that list in 19 to 21, and we're telling somebody you need to go to Jesus, he has his best life for you now, that's a problem in their mind because you're just a hypocrite. So we move on. What are the new clothes? What does Christ's likeness even look like? 
The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22b, we're still right there. The fruit of the Spirit is, here's the list of putting on, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and anything else you could think of in those categories, against such things there is no law. No one can say, you're a hypocrite, you're breaking the law and doing what you say you shouldn't do if you're doing what you're supposed to do. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified, the flesh and its passions. The old man's supposed to be dead, gone. But we battle with those grave clothes and we battle with not wanting love. Love is not just, uh, you know, what you find in Hallmark. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Who loves Hallmark movies? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> uh, could somebody write these names down? No, just kidding. How about Lifetime? No, let's not go there. Okay, let's move on. Love is sacrificial action. Are you doing sacrificial action to people? I don't know. Not all the time, I don't. Why? Because we like what we like. We want to be fed. We want to be uh, given to, not give. We want to be taken care of. We want to be helped. We want to be first. We want what we want. And this is saying, no, you're supposed to sacrificially love someone else. And Jesus says, I loved you. How did I prove it? I went to the cross, sacrificial action. You want to love me, Jesus said? Obey everything I've commanded. Well, I don't want to do that. Welcome to sacrificial action. Believers need to get the spiritual wardrobe, wardrobe on. And that means you have to give the Spirit something to work with. And that means you have to relinquish what you want for what God wants. And we all have to grow in this area. And then there might be some non-believer here. I'm not sure, you know. I don't know who said it, but it's kind of funny. You could be in your garage for 40 years. You don't turn into a car. So it doesn't matter how long you've been to church or how old your Bible is or how tethered it is. You could get your Bible and tie it to your bumper of your car and drive around, and it can look like you just lived in that thing every second of the day, and you could be living like the world. If you're Lazarus and you're a non-believer, what, do you ha what happens to you? You're a dead man inside a dead tomb with dead clothes on, rotting. And spiritually speaking, you're spiritually dead, and the stench of death is permeating from there, and no one's rolling the stone away, and no one's calling your name away, and you don't have the power to stop it, and all you can do is rot. Only he has the power over life and death. Only he has the power over spiritual life and spiritual death. And in the end, Jesus Christ must call your name. And so if he's softening your heart and he's calling your name this morning, even through this text, he's calling your name. And my prayer for you today is that you would hear his calling your name, that you would cry to him for mercy, that you would ask him, give me belief, help me believe. Do you think you're fine and you're free? No, you're actually locked in that tomb waiting. And I would just say you need to cry to the Lord from inside your tomb and beg Jesus to call your name. Cry out to him, beg him for mercy, ask him to call your name. Ask him to give you the fear of the Lord. Ask him to grant you belief. Everyone wants to talk about free will. It's his will that's the, pro that's the problem or the reward. Not your will. Ask him to make your will align with his will. Ask him that you, you want to hear his voice. And you need to be in that tomb, picturing that in your mind, longing to hear the voice of the Savior, straining that you might hear the echo. Sinner, come out. And to hear him say, take off those clothes and let them free. He's free in me. He's alive in me. And then Jesus says, come follow me, right? Come follow me. That's my prayer for us this morning. Let's pray together.